And it's something that kind of came up from an idea that came, actually came up at a um, CP editorial board meeting about how we do um, terrain representation. And there's not, as in other uh, disciplines, there's not really a standard model out there that people can just kind of pull off the shelf and be able to um, use that in order to um, try out different terrain representation techniques that they might be interested in. So just kind of as an outline here, we'll start out by talking about um, how standard how standard data models are used in other disciplines, and then um, how it could specifically be used for terrain representation, especially if we look at um, what our workflow tends to be. And then kind of the, the real results, well, one of the real results we'll re be presenting here is we've done an inventory of the literature as far as um, different aspects of different um, terrain representation articles that have been published. And so we'll take a look at that and then talk about how that could be applied to a, um, a standard elevation model for, for a DEM, basically. And then um, Tom will go ahead and show a preliminary model that we, uh, that we have put together. So um, there's a lot of different standard models out there. Um, some are more like tests, like for security and network security or face recognition, all kinds of things where you can, um, you can try an algorithm you've written and see if it, um, it can take a standard model like that and, and be successful or pass a test. But that's not really what we're looking at here. We're looking at a um, standard elevation model, a standard digital elevation model, where people could just take it, um, apply a different terrain rendering technique that they have, and then be able to easily compare it with other renderings that are out there, other maps or other um, cartographic products that are out there. Um, this is probably most similar to what was done in the computer graphics industry. This is um, kind of a famous, it's called, sometimes called the Utah teapot, it's a Melita teapot. It's not an actual physical teapot, it's just a, um, a mathematical slash cons computer simulation of what a teapot, of this type of teapot could look like. But it um, was widely used in the computer graphics industry for different um, ways of rendering this as an image. And that can include things like shading, shadowing, um, color, all those sorts of things that we're also concerned with with, uh, with terrain representation. Probably something closer to what we're looking at is another one from computer graphics. This is the, it developed at Stanford University um, and widely used as the Stanford Bunny. Um, this, is, this is actually a physical object that was scanned and then the scan was um, made into basically a three-dimensional tin, a three-dimensional um, triangulated irregular network, 69,000 um, 69,000 triangles, and then it can also be used in the same manner. Then people can take it, they can scan it, or they can um, apply different techniques to it and see how it looks. Um, this was actually offered at four different resolutions, four different scales, so that people could also, you know, kind of really get into the detail or show it in a more general manner. So if we look at how we do our, our uh, if we kind of look at a, an idealized workflow of what some of us do as we look at different techniques for rendering terrain, it could look something as easy as this, right? We identify a DEM, we um, try to come up with some new rendering technique, and then we look at our results. Um, there are some kind of steps in there, right? Sometimes we don't find the best DEM the very first time, and we have to uh, go back and look for a better, new, uh, different DEM. And another thing that happens is once we do a rendering, then maybe that doesn't look ideal. We want to go back and uh, either look at our methodology, our, our algorithm, or our program that we put together, or workflow. Or, or we might decide that we want to use a different DEM because maybe, you know, we want to highlight some certain aspect direction or something like that. So we think that some of the places that the standard model could come in is in um, facilitating comparison between rendered techniques across publications or other cartographic products. And also, um, sometimes we're actually kind of ambiguous or just don't explain what our data source is. You know, it, um, we've really found that in our inventory of articles that it's not always apparent um, where we're getting our data from. And um, this could also just make it easier or more, or more apparent where that's coming from. So let me talk about the inventory that we did. This was, um, this was a total of 77 terrain representation articles. And these, all are, were, these were all articles. Um, 71 of those were peer reviewed. And in those 77 um, publications, there were about 151 um, map figures that, that were represented. So sometimes people would show more than one result of the same method or try a couple different methods and show um, a couple different maps there. We looked at each of those publications, but then also specifically at each of those figures. 
Um, the purpose of the inventory was to identify um, what authors of terrain rendering were doing with respect to things like um, what sort of scale of, of um, what sort of scale was their, the maps that they were presenting were sad, um, what was the DEN resolution, what sort of terrain they were looking at or trying to render, all those sorts of things. And then we also wanted to understand once they got the results, how were how were they evaluating how well they did at this? You know, were they just looking, just taking a look at it and saying this looks good to me, and seeing if they could get it published, or was there a uh, a more rigorous process involved? So these are actually the categories that we looked at as we um, as we went through an inventory those 151 figures, and um, and we actually do have some results to show you from this inventory that we've done. So I'll just kind of go through these results. It's a series of graphs, and um, and then we'll talk about how this influences what we want our uh, our standard elevation model to look like. So. Um, this is the first one. These are just kind of the, the general topics that were covered by each of these. Um, obviously, some of this might have to do with the prejudice of the people involved in the, um, in the study, a lot of people doing uh, relief shading that um, are part of the study. Um, and also, we, we were trying to stay away, at least in the first run, of things that were very specialized, like illuminated contours or hashering or, or those sorts of things that, um, that a lot of people do think of when they think of terrain representation. But really, relief shading was the, uh, was the number one thing that we were, we were seeing in these articles. As far as the map scale goes, there was a very, uh, a very broad scale of mapping um, from around 10K up to um, you know, world maps that were up to 1 to 20 million. Um, we can see that if we just, it's sort of a bimodal distribution, distribution but that first, the top of them, that top mode looks pretty, um, pretty normal. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of maps at different scales, but they're kind of centered around the, the 1 to 100,000 range here. And then, of course, when you get up to the global maps, those naturally have to be at, at a larger scale. Because, and this is actually from the, um, you know, we were looking at the figures in the articles that, at the size at which they were published. These are typically um, paper publications. And actually either measuring or estimating the scale from these, uh, from these figures as far as what, what the um, authors or the publishers intended these to be published at. But of course, um, they were also working with, the authors were working with different grid cell sizes, and this is kind of something different, right? So they're, they're using a certain size of grid cell, but then they're using that in order to make an image at a certain scale. And, uh, and as we would expect, as the, uh, as, the, as the scale of the map goes up, the grid cell size goes up as well. Um, a fairly linear trend, although there's a lot of um, exceptions here. I'd say one thing notable and near the bottom of this figure is that People were using um, finer and finer resolution DEMs to make to make um, maps at even medium scale, not just large scale maps, but medium scale, because they, people always want to use the best data available. Um, for the for the source of the DEMs, um, sometimes the, the sources were indicated, but in a lot of articles we saw, almost half the articles we saw, either um, no DEM source was indicated or that it was just indicated for some of the figures. So this is kind of one of those things where, you know, maybe we've been a little, um, you know, we, we could do a little better job at, at, at documenting some of this. And if we look at the evaluation methods, um, as people are doing these different terrain representation or terrain rendering techniques, a lot of times there is no evaluation involved. There's no sort of user study or even sometimes a comparison with other techniques or comparison with historical methods. In some studies there are, but there's a lot where it's just, this is a new technique I've come up with and, um, and showing the results and if it looks good enough, I guess it gets published. Um, as far as the train types that go, you can kind of see that, um, that we tend to skew towards the mountains. Um, I think you know, that might be part because in some ways they, they might be more difficult to represent or more dramatic, make more dramatic maps, but um, we definitely have a lot, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of maps out there that are, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about terrain representation, a lot, oftentimes we're talking about mountain, mountainous areas. And we can see the same thing here when we look at um, where these different where these different articles are coming from. There are uh, a lot of times the, the maps that they use, um, of course, the Western United States, um, Switzerland, you know, different areas that have historically been, uh, been mapped over and over again with these different various techniques. So kind of informed from this, um, from this inventory of the literature, we've, um, we've kind of come up with some ideas about what we would like a standard model to look like. And uh, one of the most important ones we think is that it should be um, 
it should be offered at multiple scales. It should, just, it should not just be one scale of resolution and then we, um, we just come up with one elevation model at that scale and that's it. Um, we would want it to include various terrain types. Um, this could either be a standard elevation model that, that does its best to show the most variations in terrain in one, in one digital life elevation model, or it could be one, as you zoom out, you just get more and more different types of landforms. Um, the grid cell size, you know, we, we, um, we also want to have changes in our grid cell size as we go. We don't want a, um, we don't want a you know, one meter LIDAR data set representing the entire globe. So we recognize that there is this, um, this important in changing that. The source DEM, you know, we kind of see this as one of the advantages of having a standard model out there, you know, that people can just refer to that and, um, and use that. And then um, there's no ambiguity or, or misunderstanding there. And also with results, it's a really easy way to compare your results. If you've come up with a um, rendering technique that you think is unique, then you can look at, uh, at what other people have done and then just see for the same area and see if, um, how different it looks from, from other examples. And of course, other considerations, we want this to be um, open data that anyone can use, uh, freely available, and of course, high quality DEMs. So um, this would be kind of one of those, we've kind of looked at some examples of different terrain types. And um, you know, this is kind of one of those examples where we're trying to get as much, many different landforms on, uh, on one DEM as possible. And this would certainly be one way to go. Um, but you know, there, there would be other considerations like can we, can we change all those scales? Can we really zoom in on one of these areas within this view and really get it down to a, uh, a high quality DEM that's available over this particular area? And um, pretty much the answer for these are no. You know, we really need to get that like, really good one meter or, or you know, 3.3 meter data that is typically not available um, you know, in, in places like Ethiopia and the Andes. But the, um, but the multiple scale is, is one that we've really been kind of focused on. You know, it it ha kind of has this historical perspective. This is from Edward Imhoff's cartographic relief presentation. And um, these are, of course, hand-rendered images at various scales. But the idea here is that you know, he was using different data to, to make these maps and, um, and coming up with these different representations that are appropriate for these scales. And a lot of people have, you know, when they, when they do these terrain representations, they're kind of going back to Imhoff to look at examples of, um, of how things could be done and, and what uh, it's almost like an exemplar that sometimes we strive towards. And um, so we, we've really been kind of focused on putting together this multi-scale type digital elevation model, and that's where Tom comes in. He's going to present um, something he's put together for the Valdez area, and uh, he'll come up and take over now. And I guess you'll keep your own time, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, I got in on the, uh, the multi-scale um, thing, and uh, it's uh, a, a lot tougher than you think. Um, I focused uh, my attention on data from the United States simply because uh, of uh, availability and it being um, open source. And it, it was a challenge because uh, when you go to national elevation data set put out by the USGS, uh, the data set is really a, a hodgepodge of, of different data types that are available. As you zoom in and zoom out, you're going from, uh, you know, DEMs that are you know, created from LIDAR, then IFSAR, and uh, some that are, you know, digitized from contour lines. It's, 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 it, it gets very difficult. My, my first uh, uh, multi-resolution series that I created was uh, centered on the Gore Range in Colorado, starting with a uh, one meter LIDAR uh, DEM and then zooming out to about one kilometer resolution. Uh, after doing that, I, I looked at it and thought, oh, it's just not really working out too well. Um, the Gore Range is very fractured rock and it it wasn't a very cohesive uh, series of, uh, of DEMs that I produced. Um, while I was working on this project, I was working on a side project mapping Prince William Sound, Alaska, and so I was pretty familiar with that area. And so I turned my attention instead to um, Valdez and created a second series of uh, multi-resolution uh, DEMs. And what I'll do is, is, is go through and, and show you samples of those. Now, I'm creating multi-resolution DEMs. What I'm going to be showing you, however, are shader relief images rendered from those DEMs. So, you know, the, the raw product that we're creating are uh, elevation models, but you're going to be seeing shader relief uh, models. Um, 
Each of these, uh, these DEMs is centered on the same point, just a little bit north of downtown uh, Valdez, uh, Alaska. All of the DEMs are in the Alaska Albers projection, which is the projection uh, favored by uh, cartographers from Alaska. And then uh, somewhat arbitrarily, uh, the, the size of these DEMs is 1,500 by 1,500 height samples. I wanted to get a chunk of DEM data that was large enough to show a, you know, a good swath of land, but not too big to be uh, cumbersome to work with, okay? So without further ado, let's take a, a look at this. Um, I mentioned that you know, f you know, finding uh, a sort of uh, con contiguous set of data is very difficult. I really wanted to start with LIDAR data, if at all possible. And this is on the, uh, the National Map Download Viewer. You can see the, the LIDAR data that's available for Alaska. It's very, very patchy. Uh, there is a patch right over downtown uh, Valdez. It probably has something to do with the, uh, the terminus of the Trans-Alaskan uh, pipeline coming in there. But that's where I started the series. And then zooming um, out uh, to uh, the rest of Alaska, you can see that most of the state is now covered by uh, five meter IFSAR data, which is pretty good. It's not quite as uh, clean as the LIDAR data. There, if you uh, use it at a one to one scale, you can see a, like a, a pebbly surface, but when you downsample it a bit, it works out uh, pretty nicely. Now you'll notice that uh, on the right side of the map to the east, uh, there's another country. And that presents you know, all kinds of problems when you're working, well, making maps and preparing uh, multi-resolution uh, uh, DEM series like I, I was. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. And this goes all the way out to um, uh, two kilometer resolution. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the, the first uh, DEM in the series. It's, at, uh, it's from a National Elevation data set. It's LIDAR based uh, data at 3.3 meter resolution. Uh, you can see the little red dot just the north of downtown uh, Valdez. That's where, that's the center pixel of of all of these images as I zoom out. I thought it was pretty important to you know, actually start with LIDAR data. You know, um, more and more LIDAR data is, is coming available on NED, and I, I would imagine in 10 years' time, there's, uh, uh, you know, most of the country is gonna be filled out with this data at, at the highest uh, resolutions. And all of us are gonna have to deal with uh, DEM data that shows incredible you know detail you could see you know um, you know street you know grading patterns in here uh, house uh, leveling areas you can see a high school uh, track if you look very carefully one of the things that I don't like about this uh, this image however is the uh, the coastline uh, in this part of Alaska they have you know tides uh, daily tides that are 15 16 um, feet in range. And so determining where the, the coastline is, especially when you fly a LIDAR mission, is pretty difficult. What they obviously did is they got another source and, and kind of burnt the coastline into this. And you can see that kind of harsh line ar along the coast. So you know, I would say that aspect of this is not uh, completely ideal. So the, the, the next two slides that you see are going to be derived from this 3.3 uh, th uh, meter LIDAR. The next one is at 7.5 uh, meter, and this is just kind of an arbitrary resolution that I created. Um, you, the coastline is not as much of a, a problem here. And then out to uh, 15 meter resolution, we're still dealing with LIDAR. This, uh, when I was um, picking the center point for these images, this particular center point allowed me to go to 15 meter resolution and stay within that LIDAR coverage. I think there's like one or two more rows of height samples to the north and then I get off into um, other data. So after 15 meters, we go to 30 meters and this is kind of like a sweet spot for a lot of uh, uh, elevation data uh, studies, re uh, shade release studies. This is actually derived from the uh, five meter IFSAR data that's not quite as clean as the LIDAR. However, it was uh, downsampled, and so it, it looks cleaner. I will mention, too, when preparing these models, transforming the original data to the Alaska Albers and downsampling it, I would do it in one step. So I only did one transformation uh, when preparing all of the DEMs, because every time you transform it, there's a degradation in, in quality, of, of course. 
So there we are at uh, 30 meter resolution. We're still on the IFSAR data right now. 90 meter resolution, a pretty common resolution that a lot of people use. And then um, out to uh, 250 meter resolution. I think the Valdez um, area uh, of Alaska is, is, a, is a pretty good sample area. There's lots of mountains, a lot of flat areas. Uh, you can see in the upper right, you can see the Wrangell Mountains, which are volcanic. You can see some of those uh, peaks coming up. And my timer says I am out of time and I will finish this up very quickly. Um, so anyway, we're, this is the end of the IFSAR data derived from 5 meter IFSAR. From this point out, um, I'm, I'm combining uh, USGS DEMs and Canadian DEMs. They were all downsampled. There is a real difference uh, at, at the boundary, the US Canadian uh, boundary in, in, in the DEM the look and the texture of them, but you know, downsampled and at, at this uh, smaller scale, it's very hard to detect the, uh, the differences. And then out to 1,000 meter, uh, one kilometer resolution, these, uh, these data were derived from uh, a, a website called Viewfinder uh, Panoramas, a guy named uh, Jonathan D. Ferrenti in Scotland has this wonderful uh, source of global elevation data and you know at these scales this is about as good as anything I've, I've found out there and then um, last but not least uh, here we are at uh, two kilometer resolution we see uh, the entirety of Alaska except for the Western Aleutians and hey you could see Russia out there from Alaska <laughs> and uh, so ends the series and uh, we'd be happy to uh, take questions at this point Come on over. <laughs> And uh, I, I think we have some good news. We got the uh, microphone working, so I don't have to run back and forth. Test. Yeah. What does IFSAR stand for? Anyone want to help me? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a quick question about um, terrain type. One of the hardest relief I ever had to do was for uh, karst area in uh, Vietnam and the signal to noise ratio of the features I was trying to map and the interactions with the pixel size was really complicated. And um, do you think that we should have um, sample terrains that cover different types of um, on rock features or geology or, uh, and do you account for that in your, your planning? Uh, Yes, um, I mean that's one of the things that the, uh, the the team working on this project has discussed is having uh, various types of uh, landscapes, you know, including cars, uh, cars, uh, large scale volcanic features, you know, uh, tablelands, mesas, canyons, the whole the whole um, nine yards. So we would like to get some some you know sort of iconic landscapes um, to to work with. Well, um, thank you very much for listening to me.